we find ourselves here, at the beginning. Another tale. Another chapter. The truck door slammed shut with more rattle than I expected. It had been a long drive over the Smoky Mountains, and Jim wasn't the friendliest on automobiles or the most observant of roadway laws. It was a good thing the truck wasn't ours. I guess the rattling door wasn't the worst thing in the world. Maybe it would wake the occupant of the house in front of us. I didn't want to have a repeat of my first interaction with Jim, and I certainly didn't want to be on his side of the door. It was better to soften the surprise a bit. You better hang back in case she decides to shoot first. Funny. Everything I'd heard about it said she was a mouse of a thing. The front door slapped open, banging off the wall and making the hinges creak and groan. The porch light was off, but even still, I saw the gleam of a shotgun barrel under the soft moonlight. Being a mouse of a thing don't mean I'm not armed. Now who the hell are you and what do you want? I stepped forward cautiously, letting my face clear the shadows of the trees. Keeping my hands up in full view the whole time, I swallowed hoping to keep the nerves down. I hadn't seen my Aunt Agatha in six or maybe even seven years. There wasn't a guarantee in the world that she'd recognize me. Sammy, is that you? Her voice broke and there was a strain in it that wasn't there a moment before. She flipped a switch and the Porsche light came on. What's happened? What a question. What's happened? What hadn't happened? I didn't know where to start and the sudden flood of emotions threatened to knock me over. I kept my feet, but it was a near thing. A stiff breeze could have probably sent me to the dirt right about then. No one had asked me what had happened since the night with the stag queen. Then, something else occurred to me. Jim hadn't asked what happened. No one was there who had seen what Mama had done besides little John and me. Sure, he could see plain as day the queen was gone. But how had he known it was going to be the two of us still in the house? There would be no way he would have risked his neck if Mama had still been around and she wouldn't have waited for him to explain himself. The only way he could have known was if he had been there too. As soon as the thought occurred to me, I knew it was true. Sure, there could be any number of reasons, but something stern inside me told me it was true. My pulse quickened, and Jim must have noticed something because the next second I heard his feet shuffling on the ground off to my side. I forced myself to take a steadying breath and hoped he took it as nerves about the message we had come to deliver. I kept as straight a face as I could, and my voice thankfully did not crack. Aunt Aggie, Mama's gone. She took Aunt Lindy and Aunt Carol with her. I knew this sentence would be the one that would seal our fate. There was a reason Aunt Agatha had left. She wanted nothing to do with the haunts in the night. Said it was going to be the end of us, Holloway, sooner rather than later. And that she didn't want to sit around and watch us kill ourselves. They banished the queen and the stag, too. There's a wraith wind coming, and we need help. You got little John with you? Her tone was quiet and as cold as Pennsylvania steel. I shook my head, lowering my hands as I did. No, I didn't want him having any part of this. He's playing cops and robbers with the sheriff. Might even be running the town by the time we get back. A long silence stretched out between us for a moment. Aggie's lips formed a thin line and she furrowed her brow, so much that it cast a shadow on the rest of her face under the weak yellow glow of the porch light. Finally... She seemed to make her mind up. You best come on in, but that thing you got with you isn't welcome. He can stay just where he is. Jim White let out a small growl of what might have been frustration. Uh, You best remember, we're in this together, girl. I nodded and stepped up onto the old wood of the porch, following Aunt Agatha in the house. With one more look of disgust thrown at Jim White out in the cold, she slammed the door shut and turned the deadbolt. She sighed and her shoulders slumped, facing away from me. Aunt Aggie, I couldn't somehow find the words. They simply stuck in my throat and my eyes welled up. Agatha held up a finger to her lips and pointed at the door, then motioned for me to follow her further into the house. She led me out of the entryway, down the hall, and into the living room. There were deep red curtains and heavy, decorated carpets hanging from the walls. She pulled each of the curtains closed and I felt a thrum down in my bones. Aggie let out a sharp breath and looked up to regard me. All right, Sammy, what's really going on? I carefully explained everything that had been going on, from the briar stag escaping early all the way to Jim knocking on my door. Aggie really sat up and took notice when I brought up the omen bringer. When I finally finished, she left for a moment and returned to carrying a tea tray. I hadn't realized how much weight I had been carrying around, and having someone to tell just drained the last of my energy. That's quite the story. She took a sip of her tea and handed me the other cup. The good news is, I know how to stop the wraith wind. The bad news is, we have to do the ritual at the place where they banished the queen. The teacup rattled from the tremor in my hands. 
Just thinking about bringing the queen back terrified me. Doing it with Jim right there beside me, when I knew now that he had to have been the one behind our troubles to begin with, was more than I could take. Aunt Agatha frowned down at my hands when she heard the rattle. There was a good reason I left, Sammy. This life, our coven, destroys us. I guess if I thought I ran away far enough, these problems would stay in my memories. She stood then and pulled a book from the shelf on the back wall of the living room. It didn't look different from any of the others up there, but when she plucked it from the shelf, I could tell there were dark secrets hidden in its pages. Agatha placed it down on a small table between us and opened the cover. Flipping between chapters, it looked to me like a recipe book, only it was recipes for rituals and enhancements, not apple pie filling. When we came back out of the house several hours later, the sky had lightened as dawn crept closer. Jim leaned against the hood of the stolen truck, his arms crossed. Were you ladies ever going to invite me inside? Aunt Agatha scoffed. I know who you are. Well, then you're smarter than your knees. (laughs) I've had more experience with darker things in this world than you. Now go help Sammy load up the back of the truck. I will choose not to feel insulted by those hurtful words. Now, what exactly are we loading up and where are we taking it? You are putting these six iron rods eight feet into the ground around the place where the banishment occurred. That'll keep the energy contained there. It'll help prevent us from bringing a whole boatload of things coming back from the other side. Jim took the rods from my hands and threw them in the bed as a pickup. Agatha then handed him a big carpet bag full of tools for doing her craft. Now you're going to sit in the back with this and don't you dare open a lady's bag. I'll ride in the cab. Thank you very much. You will not. Now you can either ride in the back or walk back to Lonely. Jim glowered at Aunt Agatha's words, but he clambered into the back soon enough, muttering something about respect until the engines roared drowned him out. Should be showing more respect for them. Agatha put the truck in gear and we took off back over the Smoky Mountains for the second time in as many days, heading for home in a whole host of trouble. We passed the hours bouncing our way through the mountains, rounding the corners and driving into the banks of fog and mist. Finally, we dropped down into a familiar forest and Agatha pulled off the road. She put the truck in park and just sat, staring ahead at what was before us. A tear slowly fell down her cheek, looking at the lonely valley nestled down in between three dark mountains. The liars. Her voice was so soft I almost didn't make out what she had said. What liars? The mountains. They're the liars' mountains. Did your mama ever tell you who the liar was? I shook my head. No, she wouldn't talk about it. Yeah, that sounds like Beth Holloway for you. It was the first time I heard Aggie had used Mama's name to me, and probably to anyone in years. The Wraithween is going to have a buffet down there if we don't put a stop to it soon. She pointed off to the distance at the town, and I took my first proper look at it since we had come over the mountain. There was smoke rising from somewhere on the western side, and emergency lights flashed in several other places. We were still ten miles away or more, and a thousand feet up the mountainside. It was a clear image of the terror even the beginning of the wind would do. I don't know what exactly you ladies are playing at in there, but if you're seeing anything like what I am back here, we best be getting on. Aunt Aggie looked in the rearview mirror as she put the truck back in gear and floored the gas pedal. The side mirror shook as the old truck put out its best effort, but even through the bouncing image, I could tell what had even Jim worried. Black bears, cougars, and bobcats all stared out from both sides of the road. Their eyes were black and thick thorny vines wrapped around their bodies. The wraith wind was here, and it was descending the liars' mountains for lonely. We rounded the last corner into the valley proper, and a massive deer hammered into the side of the truck. It wasn't like we had hit the thing as it stood on the road. No, this deer had charged for the truck from the wood line on the north of the road and rammed its antlers through the driver's side window. Shards of glass fell about both Aunt Aggie and me, but my aunt didn't mind the cuts and continued flying down the mountain. Finally, I saw the old rusty bridge that marked the start of the town. Thick vines had wrapped the brims and the metal had bent and twisted. I gritted my teeth as the old batter pickup raced across the bridge and cracks in the concrete and asphalt splintered around us. Weeds with prickling thorns lay across the road on the far side to slice the tire, but we only had another two miles until we made it to the police station to get little John. Suddenly, a massive weight fell against the already straining suspension and Jim let out a yell. Aggie kept the truck moving in the right direction, but it was a near thing and the back fish tailed left and right. Sammy, hold the wheel. 
I reached over without thinking and tore my eyes off the mirror in exchange for the winding road ahead of us. I felt a heat flash up and an acrid smell hit my nostrils. The weight left as suddenly as it came, and Aggie took the wheel back from me. Just as she got control back, the front driver's side tire blew, followed almost immediately by the back driver's side tire. Jim, keep one of those damned bobcats. We need a sacrifice for the ritual. I've already thrown one. I will keep the other. Does it need to be breathing? Yes, Jim White, you keep that animal alive and subdued. We're almost there. Aggie finally managed to shake the chase, or else the wind hadn't taken over the whole town yet. Just the outskirts. We pulled up to the police station with two blown tires, and little John sprinted out to the front door. There wasn't any sign of the officers or the sheriff. I assumed they had their hands full at the edge of town. Aggie wasted no time in pulling back out onto the street on bent rims. There wasn't far to go, but we had to do it quickly. The final few miles raced by while I held John safely on my lap. Finally, we rounded the last corner and saw the Holloway farm. The wards held back the beasts and the vines, but I knew we had to head into those sinister woods soon enough. We needed something to protect us from the infectious black sap, and I had just the thing. Pulling up to the house, I leaped out of the truck, hand tied on little John. We got him inside and safe, relatively speaking. Aggie stayed outside with Jim preparing the bobcat and their tools of ritual. I moved into our dry goods pantry and pulled a jar of flour from the top shelf. All the way in the back, there was a little clay jar Mama had hid there. I took it off the shelf and opened the lid. Inside, there was a special mixture of bone meal and honey. We used it to ward off toxins any time we needed to work with some of the nastier plants around the farm, and I knew it would work just as well in the supernatural. All we had to do was take a small teaspoon of it, put it in some tea, and it would keep us protected for long enough to complete the ritual. Aggie and I gulped down the tea in one scalding go. Jim, however, refused to drink the concoction. I simply cannot abide consuming something without a pulse. Professional courtesy, mind. With that finished, we each hefted a pair of the iron rods on our shoulders and took off into the woods. It was strange how everywhere else in Lonely Valley, animals assaulted at each turn, but not here. Even after we stepped across our wards and onto the wild places, not a vile thing stirred to bar our path. It was as if the whole Appalachian knew not to enter the Queen's Forest, and even the Wraith Wind hadn't braved crossing the border yet. We reached the clearing where the Briar Stag's empty grave sat, surrounded with wide, shallow bowls. The temperature in the clearing seemed colder, and a chill swept over me. I hadn't been back since Mama had banished the Queen. The way Aunt Aggie had explained it, banishing something native to our world took a lot of energy and a lot of power. The sacrifice had to be immense. Bringing it back, supposing the beings were still alive, was a simple matter. Their bodies were native to our plane and wanted to return. Agatha liking the workings to rolling a stone up a hill. Going up was hard, but bringing it back down just took enough energy to get it out of the way. Watching Jim set the rods deep enough into the ground was disturbing, to say the least. He was wickedly efficient, and it only took him a dozen seconds to see each one, piling the freshly turned black earth over the tops when he was done. Meanwhile, Agatha set to pouring a dark mixture into each bowl in the circle and humming a strange, discordant tune over the liquid. They frothed and boiled in response. Jim, bring that bobcat over here. Set it in the middle of the circle right next to the grave. We'll push it in to seal the ritual. Jim did as he was told. He had looked younger somehow with a glowing vitality. A wolfish grin spread across his face as he placed down the feline. Do you feel it, ladies? I can almost taste it. The anticipation of the power is almost palpable. Aunt Agatha began to sing. Her voice sounded lost and sad. It was a song calling out across the space between the world we knew and the dark places we didn't. Her voice sang through my soul as though it anchored the call, and I felt a power well up inside me. Jim readied the knife over the bobcat's heart. I couldn't see his face anymore from where I stood behind him, but I could guess it held the look of a hungry predator, except he was hungry for power. The moment the threat of the wraith wind was behind us, I knew our temporary alliance would be over, and he wouldn't hesitate to devour us. I glanced over to where Aunt Aggie knelt. Her song rang out sad and pure while her hands dug fistfuls of soft, leafy soil up from the ground. She sprinkled the soil into the closest paw as she reached a chorus. The air buzzed, and the clearing felt ripe with readied power. She met my eyes and slowly nodded. I knew what I had to do, and through the power her song gave me, I could do it. Reaching deep within myself for courage and a white, fiery anger at what had happened. I took that fury and I directed exactly at who was to blame, who had orchestrated all the death and pain. With a single hard shove, I flung myself down at Jim White and pushed him over into the open grave. What are you doing, girl? Wait, 
No! Aunt Aggie hammered her fist into the small bowl, shattering it, and with it, the ritual ended. A thousand pounds of dirt fell into the grave, completely burying Jim White. He died, for whatever that meant for him. And in a bright flash of white light, Mama Holloway stood before me. She looked battered and bruised, and as though she had fought with the Queen every second of the three weeks she had been missing. And Aunt Lindy and Aunt Carol looked the same. The Queen herself rose from the earth where she had rematerialized. She seemed to grow taller and stretch. Her face was a mask of rage and hatred. Mama looked at me, horror in her eyes. Sammy, what have you done? Well, Dark Valiants, that concludes our Halloween special. If you enjoyed this episode, we are excited to announce that you can get access to tons of new exclusive content and stories, giveaways, live Q&As, and interactive events by joining our new Dark Discord community and our Patreon. The links are down in the description. The team pours over every bit of feedback we get from you and do our best to incorporate them into future releases. So please let us know through your likes, comments, and reviews. Thanks for listening. And thus, the story is ended. The tale told. The chapter closed.